Well, here we are. We're doing digestion three. Digestion one and digestion two were about the anatomy and some of the functions of the digestive tract, although it can be very complicated and you could spend a hundred lessons on it. In this intro, introductory type material, we're going to move on. I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that may go wrong with our pets uh, relative to the digestive tract. So I want to point out this disorder, I guess I'll call it, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, often abbreviated EPI. Exocrine, you know that means something's coming out of a duct to a free surface. The pancreas really has two parts, the exocrine pancreas, which makes enzymes and buffers that, put, that get put into the lumen of the intestine, the small intestine, right, basically where it starts after the stomach. And then, of course, just to remind you, there is the endocrine pancreas, which releases hormones. So, without further ado, another name for this disorder is maldigestion disorder. Mal is a prefix meaning bad. Okay, let's look at a dog that has this condition. I believe this dog's name is Lyland. I'm not sure if that's the w way they pronounce it, but I saw it spelled L-I-L-A-N-D. And if you happen to drive by, you might say, hey, the owners aren't feeding this dog. This is animal abuse. No, this dog has been fed very well, but the pancreas is not sending enzymes to the lumen of the intestine. So all the f foodstuffs in the intestines are, you know, big molecules. We'll call them macro molecules. They're polymers. They can't get into the blood unless they're digested by enzymes. Once digestion happens, then there's small molecules, which you might call monomers, that can get into the body. So here's a case of a dog fed well, but doesn't have the right enzymes. Okay, so let's continue our talk about exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. There happens to be an excellent website that has all kinds of information on this topic. You can see the web address over here. I'll circle it. My red won't disappear, I don't think. And uh, I visited it today for the first time. I've, I've known about it, but I didn't explore it. And it looks very, very good. And in fact, uh, they say they're uh, recommended by the American Veterinary Medical Association, the website, because they talk about treatments and, um, oh, they have a lot of pictures. I think one of my pictures is from your website. So that's excellent. So let's go back to Lyland, and this is a picture of him before treatment, and it's very similar to the picture I showed you before. And then over here, look at this guy. You would not recognize him, but that's him three months later. So, wow, amazing how things can change. I mean, that's almost looks like a miracle, doesn't it? Here's what they gave him, not the product name. I'm not really interested in what products there are, the companies, I should say, but some of the treatments give this pancretin, pac pancretin, I guess is the way they pronounce it. And down here at the bottom, it's a powerful blend, uh, that's their words, of protease, amylase, and lipase. Protease is going to digest proteins down to the amino acids. Amylase is going to do the carbohydrates and lipase is going to do the fats, and that's depicted down here. And this picture over here shows three months after that treatment. Pretty amazing. Now, we're going to talk about a, 
a physical condition. Up here in the upper left-hand corner, I just made atresia ani and anal atresia appear. Those are both referring to the same condition where an animal is born without an anal opening. That means they can't get it rid of any fecal material. And obviously, this would be a fatal problem if it wasn't fixed. And maybe there's not a real good solution for it, but you can make an opening. So let me give you some information. Here's a little study that was done in dogs. So I do want to say that this occurs in dogs. I didn't have any good pictures or couldn't find any good pictures. And they talk about four types and the bottom line is there is no functioning anal opening. Let me get a couple more pictures. This happens to be a male pig and you can see Probably right here would be the anal opening. It wouldn't be any further down than that. It might be even a little further up. Someplace in here. This is a male. You can see the scrotum born without an anal opening. Okay. So let me move that over a little bit and get a picture here of a calf. And I'll get it large for a minute and then I'll decrease the size. So here's a calf born without an anal opening, without a functioning anal opening. And that's a problem, right? Because you've got to have an anal opening to get rid of the fecal material. And sometime maybe down the road, we'll talk about meconium. That's a word that's given to the first feces where there's some debris that's on the inner lining of the GI tract that w was deposited there during the fetal period. And you need to get rid of meconium. Okay, now we're going to do horse colic. Colic is a term that means abdominal pain. And I suppose every animal in the world can get abdominal pain. So that's why I probably put the horse in front of colic. It's been stated to be the number one killer of horses in the United States. So it is a very big problem. I'm going to show you some things that may promote it but it's it's really a problem humans have colic human babies have colic so we're going to concentrate on the horse and this table kind of shows you that man a lot of things can maybe lead to colic in horses on the left here is dietary factors that of course are controlled mainly by mankind right the owners so um, let's look at this. You can change a batch of hay, might induce colic. Remember, these are risk, 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 risk factors. Sorry, tongue tied there. Uh, feeding more oats than six pounds a day. Feeding hay from round bales. Poor quality roughage, forage, because remember, horses need a pretty good quality roughage because they have a cecum. They don't have a lumen. You can look at all those lists. Management, of course, whatever you feed the animal is usually a management factor too, but they wanted to split it off into dietary versus management. So think of this as non-dietary things. Change the housing, take, it, take the animal from one stable to another. Maybe you moved it to a stable and then you don't ride it as much. It spends more time in a stable. You can just see all the things that go on here. You can pause this and read it yourself. Okay, so let's look at a few signs of colic. And of course, most of these signs are not specific. So uh, an animal could have almost all of those and not have colic. So that's the other thing you've got to be careful of. But you can read the list. But I did want to illustrate one, turning the head towards the flank region. And here's a picture of a horse like What's going on in my flank region? Of course, this by itself, there's the flank, this by itself does not mean the horse has colic. Maybe if it had an injury back there, it was giving, or it was giving birth, it might do the same thing. So it takes a good horse person, veterinarian, to diagnose colic. 
And here is the list of illustrations I used for Digestion 3. Thanks a lot.